Oh my gosh, this is amazing. So I don't have to ask, I, I don't have to ask how you're feeling, but I will anyway. How are you doing? Yeah, that's what I like to hear. Well, I have to say this, it's part of it. From Isabel Bader Theater in downtown Toronto, welcome to Just Work It. <laughs> Thank you so much, Colette. In 2062, Beyond a Cartoon Future for Millennial Workers is our third series on decent work. Tonight, we're wrapping up our first year of production with this special event. And we couldn't be happier that all of you have come to be a part of it. Thank you. You could be home watching Netflix, but you're here and I commend you. You can tweet and share photos tonight on your favorite social media platforms with the hashtag JustWorkIt2062. There will actually be prizes for the best of the night, so don't be shy. Hey, incentivization is part of, part of the game, right? This event is about imagining the future of work for millennials like me by talking about what we're doing today to make it brilliant for absolutely everyone. Not a caricature of the future like we see in cartoons, but a real future, a true future, and one that we're excited to create together. Whether it's avocado toast, or being in our feelings, or living in our parents' basement, too much about our lives has become a punchline. I love memes. Anyone who's been on a text chain knows that, yes, yeah? And I'm also a bit of a boomerang queen, if I do say so myself. We can joke around, but here's the truth. We ain't no joke. Yes, we're no joke. We are the largest living generation. We're more woke and more broke, and we've got a lot to lose, but we're definitely not lost. We're building a new ground game because a lot of what we used to count on is up in the air the fate of our planet, the fortunes of entire communities, and the difference between fact and fiction in our public discourse. The gravity of the situation is not lost on us. So for the next hour, we're gonna set our sights on the year 2062, 43 years from now. I'll be 76, hopefully, if the planet still exists. And you might ask yourself how old you'll be. Do some quick math, you pull out your phone, <laughs> let us know. We chose this year because it's not so far into the future that it's beyond comprehension. Just 43 years ago, it was 1976. Some decisions were made back then that we're living with today, like Parliament voting to abolish the death penalty, the completion of our beloved CN Tower, and the founding of the Apple Computer Company. Yeah, game changer. 2062 is also the year that set the stage for the Jetsons, a space-age family conceived in 1962, the year cartoons made the transition from black and white to color. This was mind-blowing technology back then, but nothing compared to the 4K HDTVs you've left at home that now ask you, are you still there? <laughs> I'm always there, I'm always there, they never have to ask. <laughs> The show aired for one season, but lives on to this day for its wacky hijinks and often cringeworthy depictions of the future. But now, let's meet the fam who will be making cameo appearances tonight. There's George, the patriarch and breadwinner. Jane Jetson, who's only described as the wife. George and Jane have a teenage daughter named Judy and a young son, Elroy. Our favorites in the supporting cast of characters are Rosie the Robot Maid, George's boss, Cosmo Spacely, the owner of Spacely Sprockets, and the family dog, Astro, of course. They live in a place called Orbit City, where workers show up for a few hours twice a week to push a button or two. We're looking back on this cartoon future to help us look forward to a real one. We're gonna be doing this through three lenses, social inclusion, technology, and power and through the stories of our guests who I'm thrilled to introduce now. Both guests are shaping the future of work by challenging our cultural norms. They're known for keeping it real while making it fun, which I know we're all up for. I'm gonna start by introducing my friend, Max Finday, who is a Niheo activist from Sweetgrass First Nation. I practiced that too. <laughs> I did, I called him up and asked him. 
I'm going to say it again. My friend Max Fine Day is a Nahio activist from Sweetgrass First Nation. <laughs> he does the important work working with Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth on reconciliation as Executive Director of Canadian Roots Exchange. Welcome, Max. Next. Yeah, let's give it up for Max. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce our guest who has come from New York City to be with us tonight. I'm a big fan, so this is really exciting. Please join me in giving an enormous and warm welcome to comedian, pos podcaster, and organizer, and the guy who we have to say has the best hair in comedy, Hari Kondabolu. <laughs> getting adjusted now. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So thank you both for being here. I'm going to jump right in and I'm going to get started with a hashtag throwback to your first job. My first job was at a home decorating and, fab and fabric store in the suburbs. I was a teenager, I was just starting high school, and there's this strange thing in Ontario called a youth minimum wage, it still exists today. So you basically do the exact same job as your older coworkers, but you pay get paid a lot, lot less <laughs> because of your age. And I remember taking my meager paycheck to my accountant dad and asking him, what's EI and why does it get so much of my money? <laughs> That's employment insurance for all of us out here. So I want to start with you, Harry. What was your first job and what was memorable about it? Yeah, I think the first job I had where it's like an actual responsibility was as an organizer. I was working in Seattle as an immigrant rights organizer. I was working with refugees and immigrants. A lot of the, the issues that we talk about today in the mainstream we were talking about you know, 10 plus years ago. So that is like the first real job I had where there was real responsibility. That's amazing. Yeah. What about you, Max? What was your first job? What was memorable about it? So my first job was uh, delivering flyers around my neighborhood. And as like a now reformed like environmentalist, you know, I, I understand the horror of what I was doing. Um, and you know, what was memorable about it was just how seriously people take their flyers. I mean, I don't know if this was a Saskatchewan thing, you know, like times were tough or what, but like. I would deliver flyers, and there's like coupons, obviously, right, in the flyers. And I'd have these like suburban, you know, like parents come out and chase after me, asking if they can get another Safeway coupon. And you know, so I, I like, I learned pretty quickly. I could get a little side hustle going on and be like, <laughs> well, how much is it worth to you? You know what I mean? You try and get double the air miles or what? You know, like let's talk. You know, so uh, I ended up uh, actually. Uh, getting uh, released uh, from that job, um, <laughs> you know, if, uh, if I can put it that way, for maybe doing the old double dip, something I don't do anymore. You know, I learned the error of my ways. That was, that was memorable well, for me. Well, I have to say, my mom still loves the flyers that she gets in the Mississauga News. That's where you see the deals. That's where you know what to compare online. She's all about it. And I have to say, I love my parents. They're so supportive of me. Uh, they're behind me every step of the way. But I still get those phone calls from from my mom after she comes from those auntie uncle parties. She's like, they were all there. They were talking about their lawyer sons and their doctor daughters. And I just didn't know how to describe to them what you do, <laughs> right? Uh, so what do your parents actually think of your job now, Harry? Again, we have to put the word job in quotations. <laughs> um, I'm a stand-up comedian, which is hard to explain to relatives in India, first of all. And then I'm a podcaster, which you don't really mention to <laughs> relatives in India at all. Um, th neither of those jobs, it's like, I'm like a shitty renaissance man. Do you know what I mean? Like this is, instead of a sculptor, painter, inventor, I'm a podcaster, comedian. Okay, it's not even a renaissance man. Those are two things. Um, you know, I think that my parents, especially now, because I'm on TV and stuff, are fine with it, surprisingly <laughs> enough. 
But no, I, I mean, I got lucky for the most part that I had parents that, that really supported what I was doing, despite the fact it wasn't the easiest route. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and I also know I'm lucky because I have, I know a lot of friends who had a lot worse, who parents who, I mean, understandably, mm-hmm. you leave everything behind and you come to another country and your mm-hmm. kid's like, I want to take a risk. It's like, we already took the risk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we took the risk for you. We left everything behind. There's no more risk to take. <laughs> so... Uh, that that's so true. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then then I then I have to give them that extra credit for just like being supportive and like keeping it to themselves at a certain point. How about you, Max? Yeah, How do your I, parents feel about your job now? I mean, so you know, my my parents know that I run uh, a national charity, right? Canadian Roots Exchange. Uh, you can donate at CanadianRoots.ca, and you know, so uh, so they know that that's um, that's sort of what I do. Um, my mom has like, you know, so I also go around traveling the country talking about reconciliation to Canadians at conferences, different events. My mom's like, why do they want you to talk to them? You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and I love her to death. You know, that's my mom. Keeps me humble. Number one fan. My father, my father is, uh, is like a residential school survivor. You know what I mean? So, um, so he is just thrilled that I'm, I'm uh, in such demand, you know? And to the point where my dad will be like, oh yeah, Max, you know, he goes around the country all over the place, you know, and uh, he's probably gonna go to over to England and talk to the queen pretty soon, you know? <laughs> you know, so he's just, uh, you know, my dad is my hype man, he's my manager, he's my booking agent, he's everything, you know, he's just, Thrilled that uh, that I'm uh, successful in his eyes. Yeah. Well, that well, you can't ask for anything better than that. I feel like there's some hype people in our in our audience today too for all of us too. <laughs> yeah, Channeling yeah. your dad tonight. Yeah. yeah? yeah, 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 yeah. Does so your coming... does your father Google you all the time? All of the time. <laughs> yeah, I got, all the, the time. I got that too. Oh, I yeah, gotta yeah. be careful what I tweet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he'll put up on Facebook, he'll put up something that I've written, he'll be like, that's my son. As if, like, he has 13 Facebook friends, they're all his siblings. (laughs) They know, Dad, they know. I love my dad. Well, coming into uh, the auditorium tonight was going down memory lane for me. I was a student at U of T. I studied international relations. And actually, maybe even in this auditorium, we learned a lot about the influence of the U.S. economy and culture on Canada. And there's a favorite phrase. It's that when America sneezes, Canada catches cold. And I know it was a bit of an epic journey to get here today, Harry, from the States. But I really do well, want I mean, you to tell us. I mean, it wasn't like a caravan. It, well, I mean. it, we're watching all the videos of the TSA agents who like aren't getting paid, and that's one of the things that I, I wanted to make sure that we asked you tonight was, what should we take or leave from what's happening to people in their jobs in the U.S. right now? Oh, I, I forgot the question. I just heard the word leave, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think it shows well, a few things. One, it shows the dysfunction of the country right now. Like, this is one of those things where. Uh, you know, government workers should get paid f- for the work they're doing. Mm-hmm. It seems pretty straightforward. The bill that they had to pass for that to happen, pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. But the idea that it's being held hostage by the the, the president, I guess we'll call him, mm-hmm. is um, <laughs> is uh, it's shocking and it's mm-hmm. embarrassing. And at the same time, it's part of a, a proud American tradition of uh, you know not paying its workers, mm-hmm. uh, which I believe began with. Um, Slavery. So it's a bit of a, it's a little retro. <laughs> but no, it's, it's obviously, it's horrendous, it's confusing, and uh, I, I don't know, I mean, can you catch, is, is Trump a thing Canada can catch? <laughs> yeah. Who, who, yeah. who, oh, are you, is a cartoon character running for prime minister here? Can you run for prime minister? <laughs> Yeah, you can run for oh, prime okay. minister. All right. Yeah, yeah. It is a democracy. <laughs> but is it like the? Do y'all use the? I know this is a side, but is it a parliamentary system? It is. Yeah. Wait. So yeah. it doesn't. So the party that has the most power, they don't they put their yeah, person the, up? Yeah. Okay. In that way, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah, it's yeah. The, the I know more than yeah, every yeah, American yeah, yeah, about yeah. your system. Yeah, I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't expecting that. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. But why wouldn't? Why wouldn't you? Of course, you'd know uh, about us. And I mean, you've been. You mentioned something that is actually really interesting to us because I think there's a lot of lessons that we're looking at about how not to um, move forward when it comes to justice and work. 
But there's also incredible organizing that we've been tracking in the States from organizers like Ai Jin Poo and the mm. National Domestic Workers Alliance in the US, um, particularly the Caring Across Generations campaign that some of you might be familiar with. And it's been a real source of inspiration because of their recent announcement about Aaliyah. It's the world's first portable benefits platform, and it seems to us like a huge leap forward into the future, and definitely a break with the past for people accustomed to precarious work like you're describing. So in the Jetsons, there's a very iconic char character, Rosie, and we call her a robot domestic worker, and her prospective employers, Jane and Jets, and Jane? and George Jetson have the first cameos of the night as we slip right into our Jetson's uh, inspiration. And we're gonna start by showing a clip. This clip is the one in which Jane introduce, introduces Rosie to George for the first time. Turns out, this is important for all of us. I'm sorry. Uh, this is really important for all of us. It turns out there are only white characters in the year 2062, <laughs> according to the Jetsons, and robots just become convenient stand-ins for race, class, and gender stereotypes. So let's take a look at this. And now, back to the Jetsons. Oh. What's that doing here? Rosie is our new robot maid, George. Good evening, sir. No maid. With the boss coming to supper, are we trying to make him think we're poor? But George, she isn't costing us anything. Ouch. Ouch. Beep, beep. Understand? Ouch. She's completely free, George. And, and she doesn't cost anything. Ha! Ouch. 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 Oh. You mean she's free? <laughs> so this clip tells me a lot about the labor society values. And not just back in 1962, racialized workers make up 29% of the labor market here in Ontario, and most of us are doing low-wage work. And the labor market is set up to exclude mostly women of color, indigenous black, racialized women, and it's really an uncomfortable truth about how racism and sexism is baked into the world of work. And I personally can't imagine a future that isn't diverse, so it's really weird and even eerie that the creators of the Jetsons could. We all actually work in industries that are predominantly white. We can say that about philanthropy and activism and, and from what we see about comedy. So Hurry, what's that like for you as a comedian? Before we get into that, I, I kind of find it strangely accurate in mm. a way because you know, if I remember the Jetsons, they're in space because the earth got so polluted mm. that they ended up, that's why like, there's these really large buildings they are big enough to get past the earth, mm -hmm. right? So to me, the idea of a bunch of white people who are potentially better off up in the sky to avoid the Earth. That's basically what the rich people are trying to do with Mars anyway. Yeah, fair enough. So it's actually about right. Like, it, it's not Mars, but it's essentially like, yeah, the poor, we will inherit the Earth, and yeah. they get to be in the, the sky. And inheriting so. the Earth doesn't really seem that, that great a problem. Yeah, we inherit the Earth when nobody wants it anymore. It's like the, the Earth becomes a lemon, basically. But... Um, and your experience as a comedian of color in a white industry, I think that there's a lot to say about that experience that does give us a few clues about what ne might need to happen in, in order to make 2062 a different place. Sure, I mean, it's dramatically improved. I mean, I'll start from a positive place. I feel like when I started going on, we're talking like 2005, going up outside of a university setting, going up every day performing, you know, I, even in 2005, I was dealing with expectations of why isn't he using an accent? Mm -hmm. Why is he, you know, uh, talking about political things? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it was a lot of layers that they, you know, humans are multi-layered, complicated mm -hmm. beings, but when you've never seen someone who looks like me mm -hmm. have multiple layers in a complex voice, it threw everybody off, even in Seattle where I started to do stand-up. So I think that's a huge improvement, having to fight... Um, against people's disbelief that I exist. Mm. You know, that's a hard thing to establish. They used to say you have to call the elephant out in the room. And the elephant in the room was, I have dark skin. And my heritage is Indian. It's like, <laughs> well, I mean, that's not weird for me. I only realize that when people point it out constantly. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I don't walk around every day, I'm Indian, I'm Indian, I'm Indian, I'm oppressed, I'm oppressed, I'm oppressed, I'm Indian, oppressed. You know, you don't, it yeah. doesn't really... You don't? How, how unusual. <laughs> so I feel like that was the first obstacle. And now, I mean, it's gotten more nuanced, mm. certainly. I think we're a little bit 
I shouldn't say we. We is a very l- large word. It includes a lot of people who, there are a lot of communities that are still at that point, right? And I feel like, and there's a lot of different uh, types of oppression and different groups that have to deal with different struggles now. But certainly that particular struggle that I think my community, especially, let me narrow this down, it's gotten better for straight, cis, Indian dudes. You know what I mean? Like yeah, somebody like Aparna Nanchela, who's an amazing comedian, like she has to deal with, oh my God, it's a woman on stage. Oh my God, it's an Indian woman on stage. Oh my God, she has a high-pitched voice. Oh my God, she talks about weird things. Mm-hmm. Like those are four different things mm-hmm. that are, that, that, it, she's all those things, and that's hard for people to, to even understand. But you know, if I don't know of any major um, trans performers who've broken mainstream who are South Asian in the U.S. I mean, all these different, you know, I think the thing we're fighting with is complexity. The fact that we're multi-layered. Like, okay, we exist, but we doesn't mean one thing. Yeah, and that's that's the newest, uh, you know, that's the newest, but that's like the thing that we're trying to, to, you know, we're trying to show that we have all the complexities that any other group of people has. It feels like even when people are trying to show diversity, it's like South Asians or, or, or people of color are depicted as victims. You know, gay people are depicted as victims. Mm-hmm. And there's the other part of that which frustrates me too. It's like, we're not all victims. Mm-hmm. Some of us are assholes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Th- that's, yeah, that's the complexity yeah. of identity is that we're not all one thing. And that means that some, you know, the, the oppressed can also oppress others. Mm-hmm. It's not that just because, like you're, you just because you're oppressed in one way doesn't mean you, you know, you can be the victim of racism and still be homophobic or transphobic. You know? And those complex layers are also, you know, ones that we talk about when it comes to indigenous communities as well. And I'm sure you face that also as an activist uh, for indigenous justice, Max. I feel like there's so much that resonates about being in spaces that are predominantly white, being who you are, and then for the things that you're speaking about and struggling with that are just your reality. What's your experience been? Yeah, it was funny. We were, me and Hari were, were backstage. We, we'd never met um, you know, before that, but we, we really bonded over being uh, cis straight Indians, you know, and having that uh, <laughs> common experience. I was, and, uh, I was wondering which one of us was going to crack that joke. I, was I got wondering. it in early. I got it in early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but um, I mean, I didn't even listen to the question, right? Like I, <laughs> because I needed Great. to get that in. Yeah. I think that you know, I think. Um, there is, you know, such a, particularly in the nonprofit sector right now, there's this, like, reconciliation is so sexy, mm-hmm. you know? Like, it's very trendy. It's cool to be Native right now. I'm digging it. I don't know how y'all are feeling about it. But, um, you know, of course, uh, that leads to people who have um, decided that they have really good ideas about um, what Native communities should have or, you know, what programs they should bring to um, you know, uh, indigenous communities across the country, and they have a lot of ideas. And I was sitting with um, another nonprofit executive um, who works in this space. He's a white guy. And I asked him a question about fundraising. And he was like, oh, well, you know, one of our board members' uncles was the uh, chief executive officer of this particular company. And I was like, damn. And then I thought about my latest fundraising uh, event, and I was in, I was back home for, for Christmas, and my auntie was like, I have 12 bucks, you know? And I was like, wow. You know? She was, she was like, I see what you do on Facebook. I just love you, my boy. I have 12 bucks, you know? And I was like, all right, you know? So there is this, there is this, like, power dynamic that still exists, even when, like, you know, Native people are trying to do the things that we know need to happen for our communities in this sector or in any other sector. Um, it's still non-Indigenous people that have the access to the money, the resources, the networks, the connections um, that leave me at a, at a disadvantage. And that's why I have to be so overly charming and good-looking just to compete with them. <laughs> It's wild. I'm an asshole. I want to be an asshole. You know, this is... Can I... Well, um, yeah. I just, want to, I just want to add on to not the part about you being an asshole, but, um, but I, I, I think 
that's a consistent thing for I think both our industries is you know money rules all. It's really about capitalism. Like when you were talking about the idea of like being Indian is in right now, I think that speaks to the idea that you know when you're going for grant money as a nonprofit, you need to structure things not based on your needs, but you have to structure things based on what they're going to give you money for. So you have people competing for the exact same resources. You have people not actually addressing the things they need to address because they're not going to get money for it, or they have to find a way to get the money, address what they're going to Want, that they need to address and then shape it so they can, you know, get more grant money. And so that sounds awful, and I feel like the same is true in, in, in my industry. Like, you know, it, it's like the, the increasing diversity of our voices honestly has something to do maybe with um, our, you know, us pushing the issue, wanting change, standing up for ourselves. That's a part of it. But to be honest, and this is very cynical, but I think the bigger part of it is that the people who control the studios and the networks realize, oh, those communities have money? They're, they're going to spend their money too? I want some of that money. Like, I think that's what it is. I mean, when you see a YouTube star like having hundreds of millions of followers and they're Asian, all of a sudden it's like, oh, we excluded the Asian community for so long because who gives a shit about them? And then I found out there's... Bit, like millions of them were like, I give a shit about them now. Yeah, yeah. And you talk about that. I mean, your first comedy album was called Waiting for 2042, which is the year, according to the U.S. Census, that non-white people will be the majority in the United States. And we actually... Yeah. Those are strong numbers for us. Yeah, Some people are counting down in here. That's, uh... <laughs> They're also waiting for 2042 right alongside you. And we actually found out that in Canada, we're supposed to hit that milestone six years earlier in 2036. I'll, and... I'll say even more cynically that even if the number is like 2042, yeah. and that's technically when non-whites... Uh, get the majority. I think it's actually longer because I think white is a state of mind mm. <laughs> and there's a lot of non-whites who it's going to take longer. And, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and yeah. that is something that is so honest and true and you know we've James seen Baldwin the way James Baldwin said it. And we, we'll, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've yeah. We've seen how power plays out, even when you have these demographic numbers. And what I really want to ask each of you is what's one thing that you're doing to make sure that our 2062 doesn't look like the Jetsons, right? Um, that, you know, some of those pieces around who has the power, what that state of mind is. What's one thing that you're participating in that's going to shift that? Well, well, existing, for one. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. That's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> Being willing to speak up publicly and claim space, I mean, clearly that wasn't happening back then. Yeah. So I think that seems like that's a big one. Yeah. How about you, Max? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's fine. I didn't know that Canada was going to hit it sooner. That's I think wild. indigenous communities actually have a lot to do with that. Well, growing we faster the than the general population by four times. Literally the fastest <laughs> growing population in this country, Native people. That's yeah. right. That's right. There is not a lot else to do on the reserve, y'all. There's just not. <laughs> There's just not. We love it. Um, you know, so that's, uh, that's truly exciting. Um, you know, was that too far? I think that's not going to make it into the final cut of the podcast. I think that's a bit much. I really like that, like, fuck colonialists out of the country. That <laughs> yeah, is yeah, all yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. We're very literal people. Well, we good. take it literally. That's good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, sure. there are certain things that we want to take into the future oh. <laughs> and some things that we want to leave in the past. And it is as personal a decision as it is a collective <laughs> one, right? There are choices we got to make for each of us and we got to make together. So it's time for us to move to a very fun part of this conversation, if I do say so myself. Finally, and my God. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know what you've been saying up here, but it's going to get even more fun. And that's because we're going to include all of you in this. Are you ready for that? All right. We're going to do a segment called Take It or Leave It. And you received a card like this when you came in. Yeah? You all got it? You got to show it to me? Well, I'm going to say something. And you'll tell me if you want to take it into the future by holding up this colorful side and cheering, because we have to make sure that everyone knows at home. And if you want to leave it in the past, Hold up the black and white side and cheer as well so we also know. <laughs> Have you got it? Yeah. yeah, pretty simple. 
So, you know, the Jetsons ran for just one epic season, if, that, if you can actually believe that. And do you know why it was canceled? Why? Because of color. Really? The Jetsons was produced to broadcast in color using the latest technology at the time. But in 1962, less than 3% of American households had, had access to it. The show in black and white was entirely different. It was dreary and one-dimensional, and from the photos that I've seen, like a little bit dystopic, too. <laughs> the bright and technicolor future of the Jetsons was lost on most viewers, and it took a decade for color televisions to reach 50% of American households. That's how we kind of see the future of work, too. Depending on your access to technology and opportunity, the future can look really bright or very bleak. Got it? All right, so we're going to practice this. And you have to be a part of it, too, all right? I'm going to pass one down to Max. OK. So hold up the bright and colorful side and cheer if you think we should take it. All right. And hold up the bleak, colorless side if you think we should leave it. All right, there we go. I like him. All right, we're going to get into this. So the first thing, this is all rapid fire. Diversity quotas. Take it. Then you have to pull up your card and cheer if you yeah, want to take yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh. All right. Mm -hmm. We heard you take it, folks. Definitely. I mean, and leave it. Leave it. Let's see who wants to leave diversity quotas. And cheer. You got to cheer. Woo! All right. I so mean, it's, it seems to be a leave it audience. What have you this, got to this say? This is in 2062. This is from now. What are we taking into the future? No, for 2062. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's tricky because I feel like diversity is important, but at the same time, do whites need the diversity quota in 2062? <laughs> well, I think we want it to be a little bit of a different 2062. <laughs> So, I mean, you've asked a big question. So I mean, maybe I guess we should we go can to our next. Them if we have we'll go to. to our next take it or leave it because I think what you're getting at is what is actually a threat to whether diversity quotas will be effective to how work is experienced. This one is white fragility. Take it into the future. <laughs> I'm watching off. Or are we going to leave it as a relic of the past? <laughs> All right. Do you have anything to say about that? Are you with the crowd? I mean, it's sort of fun to make fun of people with white fragility. I'll miss that. <laughs> you know, that's about it. It just doesn't seem like an evolutionary advantage. Mm. <laughs> Especially as the world is changing, that kind of constant, like, mm. fear of confrontation. Like, as a minority, you have no choice but to confront racism mm. or confront being outnumbered or confront being left out if the numbers switch and you truly are the minority, not the minority like, you know, in America, people, white people are claiming they are mm -hmm. because they don't have all the power anymore. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's not a, a winning strategy mm -hmm. if you're going to survive. And that's not how we've survived. We've survived by being resourceful and mm -hmm. r having a double lens. Mm -hmm. And what you're speaking to is a world in 2062 and what you do in a world where there is no race-based stress. And that's what we witness in the Jetsons in 2062. There seems to be only work worries in that world. And take this next clip that we're going to be watching in which George gets passed over for a promotion and gets a new supervisor, a robot. You'll hear a coworker being tormented by their, by their new boss while George looks on from the sidelines. This is a good one. Let's roll it. Huh? What the? Back to work. Back to work. Well, you must be kidding, George. <laughs> he looks like a refugee from a horror movie. Hey, didn't I see you once on a shock theater? <laughs> hey, George! Tell him to put me down! You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. <laughs> What a temper. At least you could have waited until he had his coffee break. <laughs> There's a lot of evidence in this series that technology was invented to pr improve lifestyles only. So making morning commutes faster, walking make made unnecessary, and most of all, human bosses obsolete. And I can't think of any technology that improves livelihoods in the show, except in this case, to reduce labor costs and to deliver higher returns to Spacely Sprocket's shareholders. So watching that clip, 
What feature or characteristic stands out for you in this about our future robot overlords? Max, do you want to take a shot at oh this? Oh my god, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's dark times, it's troubling times, you know? Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm convinced that I'm very easily uh, replaced as, uh, as an executive director to begin with, so I feel like, um, you know, uh, as we get more, more uh, automated, you know, as we get more, uh, you know, more... Uh, yeah, as we get, as the technology king As the come. robot overlords come closer yeah. and closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the current robot yeah. overlord, <laughs> I'm very concerned with, uh, <laughs> with the future. Um, but I think it speaks to, you know, the, the precarious nature that I hear from other young people where um, they, they, um, they are having trouble accessing good-paying jobs, right? They, they can only find an unpaying internship, right? Or, or uh, something that only lasts for a year, you know? I think um, as, you know, the Jetsons was written in the 60s or whatever, we're actually seeing, like, a lot of that come to pass now, and a lot of the worries that young people have for finding good jobs like our parents had, that's going to be so much more difficult. And maybe it's not going to be, you know, this, uh, this robot that, like, throws you down the trash chute, um, but it's going to be... Um, uh, a different work uh, environment than what our parents had, and I think that's uh, that's scary. You know, will I ever own property? I'm not sure. You know, that's like a millennial thing. I feel like um, it's strangely optimistic <laughs> because you know, in this particular clip, it's like the the robot is the boss, but humans are still in the picture. The way I see it, humans are not going to be in the picture. <laughs> if it's all going to be automated. Like the idea that we even have a presence there is scary. It seems like. There's the big human boss, and then all the things that are automated where humans become really unnecessary and the only ones making the money. I mean, if you take, if you get rid of the human cost of labor, you know, like companies make more money. You know, like basically robots were what slaves were, you know, except not human, right? Which makes it easier for the guilt. Right, but that's what what it's going to be, and then you have a, a bunch of people without employment. And since you know capitalism isn't really a thing that allows for the wealth to be spread the way maybe you know there there was the promise of that, you know, like it'll, it'll trickle down and we'll all have something, and the robots will take over and we'll all be on the beach. And it's not that at all. And so I feel like that that is strangely optimistic because we haven't been annihilated altogether. Yeah, and there is that piece around imagining all the different ways that tech can be utilized. And I guess what we know from our experiences and just the way that we live life is that tech in and of itself isn't a problem or a solution. And everything hinges on who uses it and how it's used and what it's used for. And it can help or harm, that's absolutely true. And it can create more isolation or build stronger communities, which we've also seen. Tech is definitely revolutionizing our work in workplaces. And I think the big question is, what is it doing to and for workers? And I know, for me, a lot of that's centered around digital media. For example, when it comes to things like Twitter, it's like, am I one tweet away from being a breakout star or from having a complete breakdown, you know? It's like, it's like that, it's that fine a point. And with tech has come new expectations about creating a personal brand that has professional power. I know that's something that I feel a lot of and we've had conversations about that too. So the question I wanna ask each of you is how has tech messed you up or made you in your work? Let's start with you, Harry. I mean, I think creatively it's been stunting. You know, it's as a comedian, like, you have these ideas, and especially the kind of comedy I do, it's not one-liners, right? The things mm -hmm. I, I think of usually are, you know, they have long setups and stories, and they build, and they involve a lot of different pieces. And, you know, I'll tweet something, and then I forgot that I ever wrote it. Because I, I get the instant reply of, like, oh, there's a... There's a retweet, and people like that. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, it's like, no, that was, you should have developed that into a more complex thought mm -hmm. that you could have shared with an audience. Mm -hmm. But you forget that this isn't real. This isn't, re you know, you're, you're not actually, you know, you have like a sentence which kind of encapsulates, it like summarizes a bigger idea, but you haven't actually gotten deeper. So I feel like it's hurt me creatively, even though it's helped build an audience. Mm. Like, I, I've gotten so many people to come to shows because of it. People sometimes find me on there, and then they watch my stand-up after. Mm. And 
uh, but it, it comes at the cost of of art. Like when I decided to be an artist, I didn't think that I had to also, you know, uh, get a major in advertising, right, and marketing. I just wanted to create art and never have to do real work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, capitalism <laughs> strikes again. How about you, Max? Messed you up or made you? Yeah, yeah. I feel like if um, we go down the rabbit hole uh, of all the ways in which I messed up, we'll be here a while. So let's talk about the making me. Um, you know, there was a study done a few years ago that talked about how indigenous people are, are some of the most uh, digitally connected people um, in this country. And so, I, you know, what I've seen from working with young people is that, like, finding a voice and, like, you know, uh, telling of story and, um, and sharing opinions and, and all this sort of stuff. And, and sometimes that can look like uh, multimedia projects. It looks like people making music videos or whatever. Sometimes it's sharing, like, um, you know, uh, fuck you, Canada meme, you know? Mm. Um, uh, and that's great, too, you know? Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I've really used social media and, and you know, uh, I'm sort of glued to my phone. Maybe that's one of the ways that I'm uh, not so good. But I've used it to make these connections with young people across the country. I was talking to somebody uh, from Pond Inlet this morning about a mental health program they're doing in their community and how, how we might be able to, to support that. So it's really been a tool for uh, building bridges and, and connecting struggles, whether you're uh, in Pond Inlet or downtown Toronto or, or Saskatoon or, or on Sweetgrass. And as much as we use tech as a tool, there are these deep-seated anxieties that you both touched on from that clip. And a third of the people worldwide are now worried about losing their jobs to automation according to a global study on the workforce of the future. But I wanna ask each of you, what skill do you have that no robot or algorithm could ever replicate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally nothing. Literally nothing, there is no hope. Um, you know, I, uh, skill, 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 skill. I make some pretty tight braids, you know? Uh, that's the shout out I wanted for my hair tonight. It took time, it took time. You know, I think um, the, the ability to, uh, to um, you know, uh, share story. You know, I think that's so important. I think that's something we all do in our work that, uh, that builds bridges or builds connection or tries to, uh, tries to come to that common understanding of, of where we come from. There's not a lot, but for the few white people here tonight, right, you know, like I think what we want is for them to, to understand our communities a little bit more, understand um, how Canada and, and the states um, were built on the oppression of indigenous people, of black folks, of, and where you know, communities of color still face that uh, oppression um, in a very high key sort of way, right? Um, so you know, I think that storytelling, that person-to-person that -person dialogue is something that uh, no machine will ever be able to do. You know? <laughs> I mean, that, that's... I mean, that, that's my only skill as well, but I use qu quotation marks for the, those in the home audience. Um, but I don't know, with, AIs, like with AI becoming increasingly sophisticated, it feels like, you know, what, what are stories? They're just a, a series of ideas and details and an order and a structure. A robot could figure that out, right? Fuck. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, I... I I don't know. I, I guess we're really honing on on how tech is messing us up right here. <laughs> yeah, it just or, or all of our, all of our jobs. It are on just the line. feels so endless, and it just feels like all the science fiction things that we saw when we were younger, which were I guess supposed to be warnings of like a dystopian future, apparently was a blueprint for some people. <laughs> like they didn't treat it like, oh, 1984, that's a good idea. <laughs> like it's not. No, like they just mapped it right out for us. <laughs> right, no problem. Right. So, you did uh, half the work, right? right? Well, Harry, you've talked about people not seeing stand-up comedy as a, quote, real job. We're in a time where so many different types of work are not seen as, quote, unquote, real jobs. And so-called real jobs are at risk of being automated or outsourced. So in some ways, you're actually ahead of the curve on this one. <laughs> so what can you tell us about what it's like to be in a job that's not considered a real job? 
Uh, if, did my mom write this one? That's uh... <laughs> We feel like you have unique insights to share. Guide us. <laughs> Guide the rest of us. Um, I feel like, you know, I imagine two types of futures, right? Where I'm, I have no value. And a future where, um, you know, the world actually ends, the environment destroys us all, nuclear annihilation. You know, we're, we're living, you know, just with basic things to survive. I have no skills to offer anyone in an Armageddon-type scenario <laughs> other than, you know, I could be a good meal. Uh, that is a service. That is a, a one-time-only service. Um, and then on the other end of it, um, you know, if, if art is something that is easily duplicated and, cr uh, and created and... Um, yeah, I also worry that, like, do, does the human experience or the human ability to create art, is that still going to be valued? Um, it just feels like everything, you know, it's always been like this, but the idea of, like, focus groups and people telling you what they want and everything being tailored to, to a particular audience. There's something really robotic in that already, mm -hmm. you know? It's just so manipulated and focused. Um, you know, it feels like we're a couple of steps away from it just being done for us. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, well, you know, hopefully, you know, by the time that happens, I'll be gone. <laughs> and uh, we, we can only hope. <laughs> well, on that important note, we are going to go back to our next uh, take it or leave it session. It. Maybe some, some hope there about what we want to take into the future so that we can make the most of all of our experiences and our storytelling. And I think that's an important part of this. So everyone ready with your cards? Let me see them. Yeah? All right. So our first take it or leave it for this segment is the sharing economy. Who's taking it? You got to cheer. Otherwise, we don't know. Okay, sharing economy. Take it one more time. Give us another one. All right. Share, the sharing economy, the one that exists right now, the way it exists right now. Uh, yeah, that's the trick. All right, should we do it again? All right, the sharing economy as it exists right now. Are we taking it? No. Ooh, it shifted. It shifted. Are we leaving it here? All right. What do you guys have to say about that? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I think I understood some of the confusion. Tell me if I'm wrong. But initially, were you thinking, oh shit, yeah, socialism, and that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then. And then all of a sudden, oh, oh, you mean like uh, Uber and shit? Yeah. Nah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is exactly yeah. what happened. Is that what happened? Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> so they're leaving it behind. They're like, mm -mm, no, we're not taking that into the future. All right, our next one is privacy. Take it? Yeah. 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 Ooh. All right, who wants to just leave it here? Forget that. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Popular opinion. We're going to take it. There yeah. you go. Yeah. yeah. Are you looking out for them too? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. So privacy is one of those words whose meaning has changed with the times. It's meant being discreet and keeping secrets in the past. But now it's all about the power dynamics between the individual, the state, and the market. Now, we're going to play another clip, and I'm going to ask you to see if you can identify what the Jetsons think of as a private trouble that is also a public issue. And let's talk about what it has to do with power. In this clip, there's a family crisis that brings everyone together, even Astro, their human-sized dog. George has been fired from the company he loves and hates. Let's roll it. You're not even a janitor around here! You're fired! Now, don't you worry, dear. You'll find another job. After all my years with the company, to be treated like this... We'll help out, Daddy. I'll get a job as a bubble hop at a space burger flying. And I'll help out too, Pop. I'll deliver tape papers. Oh, well, thanks, kids, but I'm used to spacely sprockets. <laughs> Aww. I gotta say, I watched a lot of the Jetsons, and George frets about getting fired a lot over the 24 episodes. And when he's not worrying about it, he's actually getting yelled at and fired by his boss. 
There is no evidence that he belongs to a union, maybe because unions were written out of the script because they played a major role in supporting and funding the civil rights movement at the time. Yeah. It's an important connection. So what we see here is a man and his family on their own, essentially. There is no talk of filing for a grievance or going to arbitration to get his job back. There is no evidence of a social safety net. Believe me, I watched. We don't see any neighbors or community groups coming alongside. He's in a precarious situation, that's for sure. So in a situation like this, where would you put the blame for this family's precarity? And where is the power to fix it? God, there's just so many layers. I mean, first of all, that the isolation, you know, the, the nature of their homes. Like when we talk about like uh, gated communities and stuff, it's like one level worse because they're in these homes that are separated by space, right? There's no backyards, there's no streets. It's all this open room. So you don't have the things that most communities have. Like there are no protection. The fact, like, you know, he says something which I feel a lot of workers say. It's like, I, I only know how to do this. I don't know what else to do. I'd ra I just know about sprockets. That's the only thing I do. And sprockets could be coal or sprockets, you know, could be working in a mill, whatever it is. I don't know what else to do. Um, you know, I think the major thing is the idea of, of job retraining and actually thinking about, like, what are things that people can practically do? Can people learn code? You know, like, we're not, you know, I, I feel like we're not really reinvesting, you know, instead of talking about, oh, coal will come back. Yeah, we'll invest in coal again. It's like, coal, we're talking about going into space. What is this coal business? Like, you need to, like, you know, that's such a big part of it. And this seems like a, a system where we, they invested more in technology than the human being. And where is the power in this dynamic? So the retraining, the thinking more innovatively, who's responsible for that? I mean, clearly, you know, the capitalist, like mm. Spacely, owns a company. He does not give a shit about any of his employees. He's, he's getting rid of people, replacing them with robots. Man, this, man, this in black and white must have been devastating. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's weird, because I was watching this, and I'm like, this is like a shitty Futurama. And then <laughs> you, you watch it, imagine it in black and white. Like, this is, that was some death of a salesman type shit. That was sad. You take the color out of that, oh, God. And, you know, that's absolutely right, because the power to give work and take it away, that is the kind of invisible force that's driving our economy and shaping the future of work. It's the kind of power that makes the man who is currently the president of the United States, it is the kind of power that made the man who is currently the president of the United States famous. Isn't that right? No. Since 1855, you're fired has meant you're discharged like a rifle. The original phrase was actually fired out and sometimes involved burning down your house or your desk. Yeah, it was pretty brutal. It doesn't come from a gentle place. But modern euphemisms like being downsized or outsourced may sound better, but they feel just as painful and destructive. So this last segment that we're going into is about power at work and how we use it today, individually and collectively, to create decent work and a fair economy in the years ahead. So I want to start with you, Hari. You're an entrepreneur. Oh, God. You are, you are an entrepreneur in this, in this economy. That's what they call people like you. And you may not have a typical boss, but we all know the man, if we're taking it back to the 60s, the capital T, capital M, the man, like the big boss, Mr. Spacely, someone who calls the shots when it comes to your work. So I want to ask you, who's that man, the man, calling the shots in your work? Uh, it's, it's strangely democratic, because it's the audience, right? If the audience does not find me interesting or, or stops laughing, I'm not gonna get rebooked, right? And then on the other end, if, if people uh, at, at studios and uh, you know, various you know, production companies don't wanna invest in me, I can't make other types of art that are included in, in entertainment. So uh, you know, I, I think it, it kind of splits, uh, for me it's, it's strangely, unlike a lot of other jobs, this actually seems kind of fair, which sucks. <laughs> It's like, if, if I'm not good enough because you all stop laughing, 
I'm done. Okay, so I'm not what, doing what? a good job. That's so sucks. how is I get the, fired by everybody? <laughs> <laughs> so how is the man or this force treating you right now? I mean, again, I, I have a weird job. Like I'm not so worried. Like eh, I'm a freelancer essentially. I'm a contract worker, and it's a very privileged kind of freelance and a very privileged type of contract. But you know, if if we're dealing with serious economic crisis, you know. I kind of think uh, entertainers who talk about Armageddon are the first to go. Do you know what I mean? In, in the worst times, you don't need a killjoy. Hmm. <laughs> a killjoy is, I think, in a lot of ways, uh, the privilege of generally economically stable periods. God, this is really depressing. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, to me, I think I'm in this weird position where I don't think um, it affects me as much as, let's say, my parents and my friends and people I know that either work for a company or work for the government or, uh, you know, have are part of this bigger system. I think for me, like, I'm, I'm getting loose chunks of money from lots of different sources. And there is a power dynamic to that, right? And we're talking about how it exists right now. If you were to change it so that it's different by 2062, how do you think it should work instead? In, in my particular field, I would like to see more people of color as not just the talent and not just as a couple of writers who get their work in, but as producers, as directors, as the people who are calling the shots. Because ultimately it comes down to, do I understand what this is? Can I bring it to fruition? And do I find this like economically feasible? Will it make me money? And if you're someone who doesn't have the lens of the writer or, or the lens of the story, it's gonna not look the way it's supposed to look and certain voices get cut out or misrepresented. Like every time there's like, uh, we're gonna uh, cast this dude as a trans actor. Like you can get a trans actor. Mm -hmm. why, why are you casting this cis dude to do this? And if that happens when you don't, like I would like to believe in an environment that is truly diverse, where you have not only woke people, but the actual, I would rather a, a, a person who re represents a community, that's a terrible way of phrasing, but you know what I mean? Like someone who's actually from the community make decisions versus a woke person who's not in the community. Because you know, you, when you're woke, that doesn't mean, mm -hmm. people do lots of shitty things when they're awake. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you know what's going on doesn't mean you're going to do the right thing. So, true. so I feel like, you know, that's the big change. I want us to not just have the power, you know. The end, look, the end, people of color and minority groups entertaining the majority, that's not that new. It's, it looks different. It's a little more complicated, but we've done all sorts of different things to entertain the majority. But to actually tell honest stories and get to entertain ourselves first and then everybody else can figure it out, that's new. And that's what I'd like to see. Well, that's a power dynamic shift I can get behind. So how about you, Max? As a nonprofit leader, your boss is your board of directors, and you're actually the boss at the office. Believe it, he's in charge, yeah? <laughs> yeah. But you know the man, too. Uh, who is that in your work? Yeah. Um, I mean, the man has, you know, for Native people, always been Canada. Canada has always been the man, you know, and the person getting in the way of things and the person who's like, you know, treating us super poorly. Like, Canada is the shittiest uh, uh, person, you know, to work with, you know, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of like, you know, workplace treatment. We have like, we have like, a, you know, an employment agreement, like we've been talking about treaties tonight, right? And it's like, okay, so you get healthcare and education, and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, when we go to, when we go to pick that up, when we go to claim it, Canada's like, well, you know, like, oh. um, <laughs> So, can, I mean, Canada has always been this, uh, this awful, evil uh, boss, just like Mr. Spacely. <laughs> so, you know, when I think about, I was, in, I was in Montreal just last week and I had this woman come up to me and she was like, you know, why are Native people so bothered? You know? <laughs> bothered. 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 I was like, listen, I'm a I like fix my braids, you know? I was like, listen, I don't know if you're not paying attention. We're a little more than bothered, you know? Like, this was, this was it, right? And, like, I think this is the story of Canada right now is that, 
you know, we've, we've gone through and like, uh, you know, there's been some things that, yes, have bothered Native people about how shit's gone down. You know what I mean? But can, Canadians have like been educated in a system where they still think they're so great, right? And that this Canada, that this, this country is like, is like, you know, the international defender of human rights and is like the nerdy kid in class, always doing right by, you know, everybody, and is like super great, we're all so proud to be Canadian. I'm sorry, you know, whenever we, whenever we bump into somebody on the street and it's like, no, 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 we're Mr. Spacely, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, Native people are George Jetson. You see that like two and a half year old child being like, I'll go get a job, dad, you know? Like, <laughs> listen, this is like truly, like, if I can add my own hashtag tonight, capitalism is colonial, you know what I mean? And, uh, can I just, you know, can I just say that, like, you know, we have, we have this very realistic situation where somebody loses his job and, like, all the family has to, like, pitch in and blah, blah, blah. My auntie was out of work uh, for, like, a week and a half, and, like, on the first day, there was like casserole showing up, you know what I mean? She was openly sobbing, you know, like all this. She was in between contracts, you know what I mean? But the community still came around, you know, and were there to support her in that week and a half of employment transition, you know? And I see like, you know, Canadians and they lose their jobs and it's like no man's land. Nobody's there to support them, you know? And I just think, we're the savages, you know? Like that's to me. That's to me. That's a little wild. I don't know. That's that's what I see. Can I just add yeah, something to what? I, I don't know if I, I really can add anything. You've said all of it. By the way, we should be friends, man. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. I think the thing you said, you know, just saying Canada. I think that's true of the idea of the state. I feel like all countries are so desperate, especially the ones who've historically had power, they're so desperate to keep their sovereignty and their power. Like the whole world is globalizing. People are traveling all over the world. Money's going all over the world. But they're so desperately trying to hold on to this idea of borders. And these, the, we still have control and we still have limits. And it's like, do you though? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. the surveillance state is, is not just the government. It's like all the, you know, all these companies are, are watching us too, and we're signing in. Like, I have TSA pre-check, clear. I gave up my eyeballs and my, my <laughs> fingerprints to a company yeah. because I wanted to save 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, I mean, to me, it, the government, like, is, is just desperately holding on to whatever it can hold on to. And at least in the U.S., I mean, it seems like the biggest thing we have to hold on to is we still have, at least, you know, at least as the government, we have the threat of violence. That's the biggest thing that gives us power because we have these weapons. But other than that, like, they're holding on to dear life because they know that, it, like, it really is antiquated. And these systems are deep and they're really entrenched and they've been built over so much time. But we also see that history has shown us that when people get fed up, they also get organized and they get results, right? Big collective wins, like ones that we've reflected on tonight in many different ways. But that comes to mind is like employment insurance. Mm. It happened after years and years of community organizing and it benefits all of us, or at least it should. And there's smaller, more personal wins that, coming, that come from creating accountable systems and structures that are designed to rebalance power, and that there is a, a really strong and crucial role in government around that. In Ontario, we have the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal and the Provincial Office of the Worker Advisor. This is about people getting active, getting organized, taking all of this feeling of being fed up at your wit's end and doing something about it. And I wanna ask each of you, what's the best thing you've ever won in your organizing work? Let's start with you, Harry. I mean, first of all, I mean, I know you called me an organizer earlier, which is very generous, but I haven't organized really in a decade. You know, I've been, I used to be an immigrant rights organizer from 05 to 07, longer than a decade at this point. So I'm not going to take that title because the people who actually... Can I say something, though? Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's also the view that, I mean, maybe it's personal. We also take it as a, as a group and an organization is that... Being an organizer is someone who is capable of bringing people together around a cause and pushing for a change of thinking, a way of being, a system that isn't working the way it is. And in that view, I definitely think that you qualify as an organizer. I think that's very generous. <laughs> um, 
I know people who are making little to no money working in the trenches, spending their lives, and organizers don't work nine to five jobs, right? Mm -hmm. They don't, sometimes they don't get, they, they might get paid part time, but they're working like a job and a half, mm -hmm. right? And that's what it means to be an organizer. And, and it's really neat that, um, you know, I, I get called up because I, I say things that people are willing to hear because there's a punchline potentially at the end. Um, but again, like, I, I feel like, um, you know, that's certainly why I'm not, I'm not in it for that. You know, I'm in it to entertain people. And so the people I know who really do the work, like I think they deserve to be um, in, a, in a separate category because they, they put in the work and they take the, you know, the being, when I was an organizer, you know, it was hard. The amount of like the stories you hear. I worked with people who are, a lot of people who are refugees from, uh, from Somalia and, and, and I'd hear, horrific stories about you know how they came to the country uh how they're now that they've escaped how they're dealing with you know racism in their employment like the kind of trauma that they haven't been able to heal from um and I, you know you bring people's stories with you and i only did that for a couple of years imagine someone doing that decades hearing stories of families being separated and death and destruction and and, and just the the corruption within the system like I'm not carrying that home with me every night. So again, thank you, but that that's a higher title that I don't deserve. All right, yeah. what about you, Max? Yeah, well, as like, as like a native activist, uh, I'll let you know when a win happens, for sure. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that we've, uh, we've experienced a whole bunch of them. Um, you know, for me, it's about little wins. Am I trying to dismantle the state? Of course, who isn't, right? But. <laughs> You know, I'm also, you know, I'm also, uh, I also get the great privilege of talking to Canadians, you know, and, and, you know, don't get me wrong, some of my best friends are Canadians. I really like Canadians, you know, they're good, good, good people. Work really hard. My mailman's a Canadian, actually, and uh, good guy. Um, but, uh, you know, I was, I was talking to a guy in, in Mississauga, and after my talk, he came up to me, he was like, I didn't know that the last residential school was closed in 1996. Wow. I didn't know that, um, you know, this, that, and the other thing that, that I talked about, um, that, uh, you know, the suicide rates of Indigenous young people are, are astronomical uh, compared to the rate of Canadians, that, that we have lower outcomes in terms of health or infant mortality and all this sort of stuff. Um, he said, I didn't know that, um, but I'm going to go home and, and read some more about it, right? And to me, you know, it's about, um, it's about getting to people, you know, at a systemic level, but also getting them one-on-one, -on -one, right? And changing their hearts and minds. And there's no reason why we can't do that all tonight after we leave. We, we have that, the ability, our most um, knowledgeable elder, right? Grandma Google is there to, <laughs> to support our learning. Isn't that, isn't that our most, isn't that our elder? Um, <laughs> You know, so you know, I'm, thinking about, I'm thinking about how we change this country, how we change this world, um, and it's about people taking responsibility, finding out what they don't know, and then doing, doing something about it. It's so amazing how people don't know about Canada's demonry. Yeah. Like, it's <laughs> so bizarre. I mean, because in the U.S., you know, we like, oh, that's, oh, it's our haven. That's where we go because yeah. we're liberal cowards. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we don't want to do the hard work, but like... It's so amazing, you know, I, I'd read how like in Australia that their stolen generation is such a, it, you know, it's such a famous thing, but the residential schools they set up were based on the Canadian system. Yeah, for sure, colonialism's a hell of a drug, man. You know, <laughs> it is. Yeah, and yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's contagious too. It's a, it's, a, it's a disease, it's always so funny, right? You hear Americans, uh, you know, if Trump wins, I'm moving to Canada. I'm like, guess what, you know? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah. Well, with that in mind, okay, you've all been very modest about your organizing, mm -hmm. but if we just look out, see what's on the horizon, things that you feel passionately about changing, what is the next big win that workers need? Mm. Hurry. Mm. That's a very, you know, that's a huge question. It's a huge question. Um, I think you're up for it. What, cha like what, oh my God, there's, there's I mean, so much of the workforce is like working at like Walmart and fast food restaurants, and it, they're not livable wages. I mean, I, again, I, I, I 
don't know what it's like here. But in the U.S., like certainly working at a fast food restaurant, you might be working a full shift. You're not getting paid enough. Mm -hmm. And often a lot of these companies, they don't let you pay work 40 plus hours because then you're eligible for insurance. So they make it you know, limited to be part time, right? Which in theory was like, oh, for, for high school kids because they're only working part time. But it's not high school kids, right? These are people who are struggling to make ends meet. So I think the first thing is, is, is a livable wage. People cannot live on one or two jobs. Absolutely. And we have an amazing campaign, the Fight for 15 and Fairness. Are you in the house? <laughs> that have been doing amazing work around pushing to ensure that people have a $15 minimum wage, and that's just the beginning, right? right? In terms of work that is decent and dignified, and, uh, and there's so many ways to support that campaign here, so thanks for raising that. How about you, Max? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I, when I go across this country and I see um, all the, you know, all the hope uh, that exists in this generation of, of mine, and even, even younger, all of the, the ideas in indigenous communities, and not, and reflecting on what does what does the economy of you know 2062 look like, and and is um, you know knowledge and background of indigenous people of reconciliation? How are we going to how are we going to rise to the challenge of including our fastest growing population who are literally banging at the doors of higher education, waiting to be let in, waiting to join this economy, to add billions of dollars to 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 the GDP of this country? How are we going to make space for them? How are we going to make room? How are we going to prepare ourselves and our workplaces so that we don't have somebody smudging in the bathroom because they're afraid, you know, doing like a real quick here and, you know, like, <laughs> all right, good to go, you know, and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. We shouldn't have to compromise our culture um, to, to work on, on Bay Street. We shouldn't, and after I just called capitalism colonial, listen, all right? <laughs> I'm trying to get that bread too, okay? <laughs> This costs. The way I'm dressed costs. <laughs> you know, we shouldn't have to compromise our culture to, to be successful in the workplace, and that's what we've had to do, right? Assimilation has been the name of the game for, uh, for the 150, what, one years that Canada's been a country, even longer. And I know that extends beyond just indigenous people, too, that, that, um, that newcomers, refugees, feel this, um, uh, you know, uh, this pressure to conform to, to Canadian values, one of which is hating native people. We'll park that one, we'll come back to that one. Um, but we shouldn't have to do that. And so when I think about, you know, when I work with the young people that I work with, I want to instill in them that pride that hasn't been there for our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation, so that they can walk uh, as a proud Niheo Napeo um, in, uh, in you know, uh, the, the towers on Bay Street, in nonprofits, in, uh, you know, in the entrepreneurial world, or in stand-up comedy. I think that's what I see, uh, that's what I hope for, and that's what I hope we get to. Oh, don't put stand-up comedy in that. Wow! Well, I'm trying to make you feel good, Harry. You know, I'm just trying to make you feel good. You know? I want to see more of that. I'm all about that. I like <laughs> yeah, yeah. it. So this takes us to our final take it or leave it for the night. Do you still have your cards on you? Yes? yes. Yeah, we still got it? All right. So this one, I, I feel like, I, I don't know how the audience is going to be around this one. Co-working spaces as they exist right now. Oh. <laughs> take it. Yeah. <laughs> got one big, strong champion. Yeah. Leave it. Yeah. I, 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 would, I would take it. Yeah? I what would, about it? I would take it for two reasons. One reason why I would take co-working spaces is that selfishly, like, I work alone and I get very lonely. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the second reason is that implies all of us are still working, which... Yeah. <laughs> considering an automated future is a very good sign. It's very hopeful, that's yeah. true. All right, and our last one is nine to five. Take it, not the song, like the actual thing, yeah. yeah. Nine to five, take it. Okay, I gotta hear you, I can't hear, if I can't hear you, I don't know. All right, and leave it. Yeah. Big, big shout out to, to leave nine to five behind. Can you talk to me about that a little bit? Leave it. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a morning person, you know. I'm, I'm a night owl. I get things done at four o'clock in the morning. 
uh, you know, when nobody else is up and around, after I've gone through every meme account that I follow on Instagram, I'm like, all right, it's four o'clock, I'm ready to get to work. <laughs> I'm ready to reconcile this country, you know? So that's when it happens. I mean, it feels weird. It seems so, uh, it doesn't fit the kind of work many of us do, you know? I mean, my mom works in a hospital, like, she needs to put in the hours. Mm. It's not mm. like, I I'll do all my work in three hours, then, no, the pa patients don't work that way. Ah, you got a heart attack, but like, you know, we're only doing three hours today. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I get why that, you know, sometimes there are jobs that are, are longer, but I, I think for a lot of us, it just feels like a very antiquated idea mm -hmm. to have set hours and, you know, and the weekend's just these two days and then you work the week. It's very, um, I, I don't think it's, it's practical. And to be honest, I think most of us, maybe I, I shouldn't speak for all of us, but most of us only do 15 to 20 minutes of work oh. in a week. <laughs> That's, that's the truth telling we're about tonight. Well, also like many of you, I'll be at my desk tomorrow morning at nine, right? Yes, many of you, yes, yeah? yeah. So it's time for us to wrap up and I'm gonna wrap up with one last question. Mm. Hurry and Max, tell us about someone or something giving you hope for the future of work. Mm. Oh. Max, yeah. someone, something giving you someone, hope for the future something. of work. Someone, something. You know, I, I, I can't stop talking about uh, how proud I am of, of my nieces and nephews, my cousins, my, um, you know, my, my community who uh, have come through so much in the last, you know, uh, last little while um, and are still uh, reaching out um, with an open hand to Canada, uh, ready, to, ready to reconcile, ready to... Um, put right uh, everything that has gone so wrong for so long in this country, um, I think that's a real gift uh, for Canada, to Canada. And I get mad at Canada sometimes. You guys are assholes sometimes. And, uh, you know, um, I'm always reminded by the generosity and, uh, and the love of, of young people who, who just want um, to have what our ancestors envisioned, and that's um, peace, prosperity, and mutual respect. And to me, I think if we can build, if we can build a country, if we can build an economy, if we can build a workforce on those values, then it will be good for everybody. Yeah. That's great. I mean, How about you? I'm, I'm really inspired by a lot of the art I've seen recently. Like, I believe in art that challenges power. I believe in art that can bridge these gaps in communication and culture. I, you know, I, I, I believe in, in thoughtful choices and, you know, I, I saw um, if if Beale Street could talk, and I think, um, you know, I think the work of Barry Jenkins is so beautiful, and the storytelling is, is so well done, and the fact that he was able to take a Baldwin, you know, book and make it into this piece, like I think it's absolutely incredible. Uh, the work of my friend W. Kamau Bell, like I'm, um, you know, Kamau has a shown scene in called The United Shades of America, and what I love so much about it is that when he goes to different communities and talks about different cultures, whether it's the Sikh community, whether it's going to Qu uh, San Quentin and talking to inmates, he lets th the people that the topic is about talk for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we need to do a lot more of. Often we end up having people talking for large groups, like, no, I think I can talk for myself, just give me a chance. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's inspiring to see someone who, who is successful without compromising his values. And at the end of the day, he knows that like, this is about getting as many voices out there. It's about us a lot, like us having the right to humanize ourselves and complicate our own stories. Um, Cause it, it, representation has real life impacts, whether we get hired, whether how we get paid, how we get treated, often that gets dictated by what images, you know, we've been programmed with. So I'm, I'm, I think those are just a couple of examples of people that are, keep me going. And those are incredible examples. Thank you both so much. And I get a chance to also tell you what gives me hope. And what gives me hope is all of you, the both of you and everyone who's out here tonight. You know the old saying, never doubt what a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens, ca never doubt. I will. It's such a good saying that I'll say <laughs> yeah. it twice. Yeah. Uh, Margaret Mead, uh, the, all respect, uh, may you rest in peace. Um, 
Uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Who's heard that one before? Yeah. Yes. But we also know that people with privilege and pr conventional power will continue to write history if we don't show up. Mm. They're also the ones who have the time and resources to imagine the future and make it a reality, if not an inevitability. On the 50th anniversary of the Jetsons in 2012, the Smithsonian Museum actually asked the public how expectations might have changed if George had taken a flying bus to work instead of a car. What if Jane had worked outside the home? Or what if Judy or Elroy even had one black friend? Far from being frivolous, our imaginations are powerful. They can envision solutions to problems, conceive and choose from among options, and set ambitious yet achievable goals. They can conjure up worthy dreams, not just slicker versions of the present with its persistent inequalities intact. And then we can embody them, live into them, and make them real. It starts by slowing down to connect with each other, take in the big picture, maybe even excavate the absurd and profound and recommit to a vision of what's possible. Like George, I think we all want to step off that fast-moving sidewalk. Jane, get me off this crazy thing! That's what he cries at the end of each episode. And in that cartoon future, he doesn't have a choice. But we definitely do. We can get out of this rerun and move beyond it. We can choose something much better for ourselves and our future grandchildren and fight for it. Thank you all for choosing to be here tonight. And thank you to all of our listeners around the globe for choosing to subscribe to Just Work It. Please join me in thanking our incredible, smart, brilliant guests, Hari Kondabolu and Max Fine Day. Let's give it up for them. Am I out? And a special, a very, very special word of thanks to Radia Chaudhry, who is our producer, who is the producer of tonight's podcast, to Laura Ziemba from Paper Chase, who has been our event producer, to the irreplaceable Nora Cole, our executive producer, Pat Thompson, and everyone else who has been helping behind the scenes. 